Hello and thank you for joining today's acquisition seminar hosted by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Today's session titled Category Management and the Acquisition Gateway, the Future of Federal Acquisitions will help us understand the federal government's transition to category management and how to use the Acquisition Gateway to support the acquisition lifecycle. We'll also receive a demonstration of the Acquisition Gateway. To enlighten us on category management and the acquisition gateway and how they will help better meet the evolving needs of the acquisition community, we have representatives from the General Services Administration with us today. They're going to help us understand what category management is, how it's structured, and provide a live demonstration of the acquisition gateway. Now before we begin, I want to remind you we'll finish today's presentation with a live question and answer session. If you have questions about anything you see or hear, please submit them using the survey link to the right of the video screen. Now, let's get started. I'm very pleased to introduce Laura Stanton, Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Strategy Management, Federal Acquisition Service, General Services Administration. Welcome, Laura. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, John. I'm happy to be here today. Now, let's start with the topic of category management. The federal government has been making changes to its acquisition approach, so it has developed category management. Can you tell me what that is and where it came from? Thanks, John. So category management is a review process and a management process that the private sector has been using to manage how they buy goods and services for the past 20 years. I think the best example for it is to think about a grocery store and that the buying for produce, um, apples, oranges, bananas, greens, is very different than how you want to be buying your seafood or your meat. And so what happens is that category managers are named to identify expertise in those areas and really begin to think through what strategies, what does the market look like, who are the suppliers, and how do we really effectively get the best deal for that. So translate that grocery store into what the federal government does and think about it in terms of IT, facilities and construction, and the categories of goods and services that you're purchasing to meet your mission needs. And think about that and then begin to translate in that into who are the suppliers? What best practices are there for buying in those categories? How do you know what the prices paid are? What's really the most effective way to think about how the government should act as a single entity as opposed to decentralized purchasing for those categories. So I think if you think about it like that, John, it really begins to relate it back to the strength that we can do, that we can bring to category management across the government acquisition workforce. So why is the federal government implementing category management now? What's the imperative? What's driving it? So where we are is that the government has decentralized its purchasing. We have over 500 different offices making common purchases such as laptops and desktops. If we take the laptop and desktop example, OFP, Office of Federal Procurement Policy, put in a laptop desktop policy to uh, reduce the number of contracts down to three core contracts to be making those purchases. But the reason they did that is because upon review, they discovered over 10,000 contracts across the government for buying the laptops and desktops, which are basically a commodity type item. And so what we're doing is instead of effectively using our workforce, we're decentralizing them and having them do the duplicative buys over and over again. Category management is an opportunity for us to look at it strategically and see is there a better way that we could be buying some of these common goods and services. And that way, the acquisition workforce can really remain focused on what the core mission and the unique needs of their agency and their services are. Laura, this sounds a lot like strategic sourcing, which is another acquisition process I've learned about. Is it the same or how is it different? So strategic sourcing is a tool that can be used as part of category management. But when you're thinking about category management, think about, as I mentioned earlier, we have the 10 government-wide categories. And that consists, uh, I mentioned IT, professional services, facilities and construction. And so by looking at the spend holistically, what we begin to understand is what agencies are spending the most amount of money in those categories which agencies have the best practices for being able to effectively buy and accomplish their missions in those categories, and we can begin to collaborate and share information. And at that point, what we can identify is, are there strategic sourcing opportunities? Or really, should we be just looking at demand management? 
One of the examples that I love is that the Army Corps of Engineers has a demolition center of expertise. Demolition is a specialized type of expertise. Sustainable practices and greening, uh, green demolition is very important to being able to effectively do this. Um, and it's a need that many agencies have. When the facilities and construction category began working together, they discovered this expertise in the Army Corps of Engineers. And so what that team's now looking at is how do we share that Army Corps of expertise across all of the government? And what I've cited is only one example. So begin to imagine what the possibilities are as we're looking across $280 billion of common spend across the government for areas of expertise, best practice sharing, um, using a single contract or a limited core of contracts and how that can change our purchasing practices and how we th and how we engage with the marketplace. So I'm sure that there has been success using category management. What successes have you experienced so far? I'd like to cite an example out of the Federal Acquisition Service. Our Office of Fleet Management has been doing category management for years. And so what they've done is they've developed relationships with the big suppliers of automobiles understand how the market works, what the buying cycle is, what features the government needs. They work with both the suppliers and they work with the customers to understand what the customers need. And so they take that and then they effectively go out, acquire the vehicles and sell them as a shared service. But by doing that, they've also been able to, uh, by being the single buying entity, they've also been able to knock 19% off of the list price at a dealership. So what you have is really something that benefits the government because we understand both the acquisition cycle and then we're able to understand what are the standard metrics for maintaining and keeping those vehicles on the road. We also know at the end of that cycle, at the end of three years, is at the point in which we're able to get, uh, receive the most money for the sale of those vehicles. So what you're thinking of is really the cradle to grave life cycle management and that's where we want to be with other categories. So the way that category management works is Office of Federal Procurement Policy named the 10 government-wide category managers back in February. And so what those category managers have been doing, so what we have, I keep talking about facilities and construction professional services, but we also have categories for office management, travel and lodging, transportation and logistics, human capital, um, other medical core things in goods and services that the government purchases. So there's been identified category managers for each of those 10 categories. And what those category managers has, have done is, as I mentioned earlier, they identified the top spending agencies in that category. They've begun to pull those agencies together. And what they've also done is develop, pull the data together to really look at where the money is being spent in that category, where are there opportunities to improve how we purchase, and they've developed a category management plan. So you really start out by developing that plan. And in order to develop the plan, you have to do the data analysis, the supplier analysis, understand the best practices, and understand what the government's already doing. That comes together in a plan. That's approved by the Category Management Leadership Council with a series of initiatives that are looking at how do we improve that category. And improvement of the category means things such as increase or maintain the small business spend for that category, reduce the number of contracts, look for opportunities for savings. And each category is being tracked against the, that set of metrics. So then the initiatives are, going, are being exercised. And so those initiatives might are unique to each category. And there are things such as identifying the best-in-class contracts. Which contracts are collecting the transactional data were built collaboratively across the government and will really be the most effective tool for the government to be able to achieve its needs. And then we manage it. And But what I mean by manage it is we track the performance, we do the performance monitoring, all of those um, activities that allow us to see are we making a difference by identifying the best-in-class contracts, by having people use the acquisition gateway. Are we seeing fewer contracts being awarded and a move to enterprise contracting? Uh, so when you look at all of that, that's the category management life cycle. Office of Federal Procurement Policies taking the lead in managing and organizing that and GSA is supporting them. Great. Well, with a name like category management, you obviously have categories. What are the categories? How many are there and where do they come from? 
So let me run through them. We have the uh, information technology category, professional services, security and protection, facilities and construction, industrial products and services. Then we go to office management, travel and lodging, transportation and logistics, human capital and medical. So the way that those were developed is there, were, there was also nine defense-centric categories. So, but the way that the 19 categories were developed was really looking at a cut of all of the spending out of the federal procurement data system. And it was broken down into common product service codes, and those codes were aligned to create the 10 category, to create the 10 common categories, which comprise about 280 billion of the spend. And that was done in partnership with Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and GSA to really make sure that this taxonomy made sense. And so when I talk about the categories, that's the structure. Part of the category manager's responsibility, though, now that we're, actu now that we're operational, is to also assess, um, are there some adjustments needed in order for these categories to make more sense to the acquisition, to the way that we actually acquire goods and services? OK. Can you give us a few real life examples of category management in practice? Let me go back to the laptop desktop initiative that I cited earlier. So Office of Federal Procurement Policy recognized that laptops and desktops are commodity type items. And so what they asked is for a group of agencies to begin to collaborate and develop common specifications. So what we're doing is developing that common requirement. And they that was then taken and formed into the laptop desktop memo with the, re with the request that, with the requirement that agencies begin to buy, civilian agencies, begin to buy from either NIH NITAC contract, NASA SOUP, or GSA's Schedule 70, and that they buy the standard specifications. So the reason for this is that will allow the government to be buying both standardized equipment across the board and it begins to tell the supplier market, this is what the government wants, and we're beginning, building common requirements brings down the price. So immediately afterwards, we began seeing price reductions up to 50% on some of these items. So that's a very detailed and specific example of how category management works and, how it's, and what's happening in, today in the world. As I mentioned earlier, it came out of the commercial world. So the commercial world, this is something that IBM, Johnson & Johnson, and other key Fortune 500 companies have implemented with great success, and that they consider key to their market success. In terms of the public sector, we have, a meeting, um, we have regular meetings with the United Kingdom and with the Canadian government who are both deeply interested in category management. The United Kingdom has been doing it for the past 10 years, and the Canadians are beginning to move in that direction as well. So what we're trying to, what we're looking to determine is how can we collaborate across governments as well in order to share the best practices of category management. So how will we know when we've seen category management success? How do you quantify or measure it and then report it? That's a really important question. So category management initiatives to date have already saved $2 billion for the American taxpayer. And we're tracking that, as I mentioned earlier, one of the metrics that each of the category teams is tracking is what type of savings, both real and administrative savings, are being achieved by the category management initiatives. Also, the small business metrics a very important one. How do, we, how do we understand the small business community so that we can increase their participation in each of these categories by better understanding the marketplace and, what the small business, and how the small businesses can contribute to the government's success? So how is category management supposed to benefit the acquisition workforce? What's in it for them? Category management, so if we think about category management, um, I like to think about it at three layers. So I've talked about the category manager and the strategic role that the category manager and the team are playing. Then the agency also has an opportunity to use category management to understand how they're spending and how they're buying within specific categories. And then finally, the acquisition workforce is where the rubber hits the road. So the decisions made by both the contracting officers, contracting specialists, and the program people are what really drive the change that can be achieved by category management. And the connection needs to be made from those category strategies down to the workforce and how they're going to be implementing them. And what that really means is that the workforce is going to see 
increased knowledge of best practices for specific categories, better information about what the best-in-class contracts are for the category, looking at prices paid data as we begin to collect transactional data so you can, so you can compare pricing more easily and understand the pricing structure, see statements of work that represent best practice, and begin to also be able to see how do you buy within a specific category to effectively achieve the goals that you want to achieve. Well, let's talk more about new solutions and how the federal government can move towards category management. Are you at GSA institutionalizing the principles of category management? And if so, how? We are. So we're doing, the key thing that we're doing is supporting both the government-wide category management initiative that I've been speaking about and developing and organizing the acquisition gateway. Um, you'll hear in a moment from Andrea Azarkan Heller about more about the acquisition gateway. But what that is, is a tool that effectively takes all of that information that I just talked about that benefits the acquisition workforce and gives and gives provides the platform in order for you to be able to access it. So you can see those statements of work, you can see the pricing, and that all the information is available for use to make your acquisitions more effective. Well, what could an acquisition professional find on the acquisition gateway? So the acquisition gateway also includes a project center that allows you to store your information and begin to, um, and in the future, to collaborate with your colleagues. There's contracts across the government that allow you to search by category and see what contracts are available for IT purchases or travel and lodging or medical supplies or services. You're also able to join community discussions of both category managers and others in your field to be able to understand and reach out so that you're not limited to whatever your personal network or your cell phone, the numbers that are in your cell phone when you're reaching out for information. So it's really a way to both connect across the government community, learn from one another, and be able to achieve better results. And let me just point out that the acquisition gateway has been evolving. So what is static today or what was static even um, a few months ago, we want to make into much more dynamic tools and something that you can connect to and use as you develop your acquisitions and as you move to understand and learn more about how to how category management and the specifics of each category. Well, Laura, thank you so very much for providing us with more details on category management and what it entails for the future of federal government acquisition. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate the invitation to join you today. Now, let's check out a demonstration of the many features of the Acquisition Gateway. Andrea Azarkan Heller, Acting Director of the Stakeholder Management Division, Office of Strategy Management, Federal Acquisition Service, General Services Administration, is here to guide us through. Andrea, thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. And hi, everybody out there in virtual land. So Laura's kind of teed up the demo, so we're going to get right to it. So what is the gateway and where did it come from? So a couple of years back, we did a survey of the acquisition community, and we found not so much that they wanted another tool to do their procurement uh, on a contract writing system or some other electronic mechanism in which to conduct a procurement, but they wanted a uh, area where they could really interact with the acquisition community, get best practices, lessons learned about particular products or services like professional services or cleaning supplies or IT hardware. And so that's really where the vision of the gateway came from. Also, Laura had mentioned earlier, government acquisition is extremely fragmented across 500 different departments, agencies, bureaus, match comps, whatever you want to call them. So it's really time to come together as a federal government and act as one to improve our acquisitions. So some things that you can find on the Gateway, Laura mentioned some expertise. So learning about you know a new product or service, especially if it's not necessarily something that you've bought before, uh, the Gateway is really great for that. In addition, the ability to compare government-wide solutions uh, next to each other is very, uh, very valuable and a powerful tool that we have in the Gateway as well. Also, data transparency. So Laura had talked about a category management. This is a big part of uh, category management and being able to see things like transactional, historic prices, paid data uh, when you're putting together your procurement is also very helpful. 
And then also, I had mentioned the ability to connect and contribute with others in the acquisition community. I used to be a contracting officer myself, and I'm completely guilty of this. If I needed help on a procurement, I would perhaps ask the person next to me or the person down the hall, but not necessarily another person in my agency, perhaps in another state, or somebody in another agency buying the same thing, but down the street, or even somebody else on the other side of the world. So you're really able to connect with others in the acquisition community uh, and get their best practices, lessons learned, and use them for the, your own procurement. So we are gonna go to the Gateway homepage. So in order to log on the Gateway, and you'll see I'm actually using Laura's computer, uh, if you use your search engine to go to uh, and type in how to log into the acquisition Gateway, you can actually uh, view a YouTube video that will take you through that process. So I'm going to share some screenshots of what that actually looks like very quickly. So to get into the gateway for the first time, you'll go to OMB Max. So that's max.gov or max.omb.gov. Um, and you'll see the home page here and you'll click on this green register now button. So that'll take you to page that'll ask you for your information, your email, work address, that type of stuff. Uh, and also ask you to hit a continue button, which will show this user agreement and non-disclosure. And you'll see this tiny checkbox here that you'll click and it says, I agree. And so once you do that, you'll go back into your email inbox and it'll say, dear so-and-so, congratulations, you now have access to the Mac system. Now go and change your password. So you'll be redirected back to Max, and you'll follow the steps to change your password. So next you'll visit the gateway at hallways.caf.gsa.gov and this is a screenshot of what that page looks like. You'll click on federal government users. And so what that'll do is actually take you back to Max where you link your PIV or CAT card to your OMB Max account. And we do this because Laura mentioned we have uh, some proprietary information on the gateway, primarily uh, transactional prices, paid data that we need to keep secure and for federal government users only. So you'll enter in the Max user ID and password that you just created and then link your user ID to your PIV or CAT card. And that might take a couple of minutes, so you can feel free to run any other programs in the background and come back to it. And you should get this, congratulations, your PIV card is now associated with your Max ID. And then if you hit continue, it takes you into the gateway. And so that's actually what we're gonna do right now. And you'll see I've already logged in and I'm actually on Laura's computer. So this is what the Gateway homepage is laid out like. The project center where you can create an acquisition. The 10 hallways, or actually the nine hallways on the left. Solutions finder where you can access government wide contracts. Some various resources and I'll walk through a few of those. Our community function which is like a social media slash discussion area. As well as some new information and training and events. So we're gonna go through this demo through a case study uh, through the eyes of Janet C. Officer. And so she is a contracting officer in her department and she primarily does professional services and she really cares about doing things right. So compliance is super important to her. So her task at hand is that she has to do an IT cloud services procurement. Uh, there was a termination for default that happened in her office and now she needs to go back and get another contractor to fill in the gaps. Problem is she's never really worked with IT before because she has that heavy professional services background so she's not quite sure where to start. So her inclination is to, hey, let me go into the gateway, build my procurement, get smart on this new thing that I haven't bought before and go from there. So that's what we're gonna do. So the first thing that Jan is gonna do is create her project in the project center. So I'm gonna add a project and I am going to call this IT Cloud Services. And she needs it soon, so let's say she needs it by the end of July, and we'll make this a Friday. And she can put whatever in the description or the notes, but for the sake of the demo, I'm gonna put test and test, and I'm going to hit save. And so there's Janet's project, and so I'm gonna open it up you can see some other things that Laura has listed in here. And I'm going to add a task to her project. Let's say she needs to have market research done. And the Gateway is a really great tool for market research. And she would like to have that done sooner rather than later. So let's say she wants that done, close the business Friday on the 24th. And she's going to hit save. 
and that's related to her project now. Let's say that she also wants to have an industry day related to her project. And let's say she wants to have that at the beginning of June. And that's going to be a one day event. And that's going to be from 10 to 11. It's going to be in Washington. And I'm going to put a note here. And I'm going to hit save. And so that event has also been added to the project. And that way she can use these tasks and events to manage the different milestones, the different things that she needs to do throughout her procurement. So we're going to go back to the home page. And the nothing, next thing that we're going to do is go into the solutions finder. And you can see that the solutions finder already knows what agency you work for based on uh, your login because your own BMAX account is linked to your Pivot CAC card. So it shows GSA because Laura's logged in as GSA. So we're going to see what's available. So out of the 215 solutions in the gateway, and this number grows every day, as a GSA employee, you have access to 149. So if I take this GSA filter out, you can actually see the other agency filters and how many contracts those folks have access to. So since Janet is buying IT for this case study, let's click on what is available in the IT category. And you can see that there are 81 results related to IT. Now if I type in cloud, that number changes to 13. So let's actually compare some of these solutions to see what they look like. So let's pick Alliance with NITAC Soup and Vets. And I can compare up to four solutions at a time. And when I hit the compare button, you'll see all those solutions side by side. So what they are, what kind of solution type it is, any fees associated, the term of the contract, who you can contact if you have a question, who can actually use that particular contract, and then what's actually on the contract. You can go straight to the solution website and you can also see, depending on what that particular program office has given us, either the terms and conditions of the contract or the master contract file itself. So we're going to go back into the gateway. And the next thing that we're going to look at is eBuy Open. And so this shows stuff in the eBuy system, anything, request for quotes, request for proposals, active, canceled, or closed from FY14 on, because we had to start somewhere. So let's say through Janet's market research, she's decided that she needs infrastructure as a service. So we're going to type in IAAS. And out of the 190,000 plus RFQs in the system, that whittles down to 16. So let's actually take a look at one of these and see what was bought. So you can see here that there's an attachment uh, uploaded to the request for quotes. So that's something that Janet could potentially download and use for either market research or requirements development. Also looks like a statement of work. Um, the description of what the buy was, who did it, uh, when, and then also their contact information, which is really valuable in case, say, Janet has a question. Oh, how did you do this? What worked? What didn't? Next thing we're going to go into is prices paid. And so this shows transactional historical prices paid data from various data sources. And I'll actually open those up in a minute so you can see what those are from primarily products. But we do have a few data sources related to services here. So you can see some of those here on the left. So a lot of product stuff, Advantage, OS2 as an example, uh, print management. Uh, but we do also have some services related stuff. So the OASIS multiple award contract, uh, government wide acquisition contract, so the GWACs. So let's actually see what that looks like.
So out of the 50 million plus data records, there are 74,000 related to government-wide acquisition contracts. So let's download those in Excel and see what they look like. So now that I've downloaded the CSV file and opened it up in Excel, I can actually see some of the historical prices paid data for government-wide acquisition contracts. So you'll see, let's see if there's anything that Janet might need in here. Oh, project manager. That's probably something she's going to need for her procurement. So it looks like the Army got a project manager for X amount of hours for X price. You'll see that there is some information that is redacted, one being the contract information, but if it's a government-wide acquisition contract, you can at least narrow it down to the list of GWACs that are available. And then also the vendor information is redacted as well. So that this information is redacted not only in the GWAC data set, but also in the OASIS data set if you're trying to buy professional services as an FYI. So we're going to come out of that and we're going to go back into the gateway. Say, Andrew, before you go to the next section, I have to ask you about the information and resources in the gateway. Do those come automatically from other systems or do they come only from what other gateway users provide? So that's actually a great question. It comes from those things uh, as well as from people that manage the hallways themselves. So I'll talk about that a little more. So the information from eBuy Open is a straight up data feed from the GSA eBuy system. The information in the prices paid portal are various data feeds from GSA contracts as well as any external contracts that other agencies have agreed to post their information on like a Army Chess or Transcom for example. The information community comes from a combination of the acquisition community on the gateway as well as the folks that manage those particular community groups, so like a professional services or a motor vehicles or something like that. And then the information in the hallways, which I'll go in a, a little bit, is curated by content managers where that's a large part of their job to monitor what's on there and post things that are relevant to those particular products and services. Great. So next we're going to go into the community section. And you'll see since I'm on Laura's computer, this is her profile. You can see the people that she currently follows. So let's actually go ahead and add a person while the various to topics are loading here in the middle. OK, so let's find, we'll type somebody that I know. Oh, here we go, John Feldman. He's the Gateway team lead. So we're going to hit follow. And while it's thinking, there we go, congratulations, Laura is now following her. So awesome. So we're going to close out of this. You can see the various groups that you can follow here on the right. If you want to pre post your own topic, you can do that here as well. And also see the feed, the general feed here in the middle. So let's actually click on one of these to see what it looks like. So I'm going to view more. So you can see that Zach Lerner posted something on NAICS codes and set-asides. And you can vote up or down if you found this information helpful. And you probably saw this as I was going through Solutions Finder. You also see this on the Statement of Work library, which we'll go through in a little bit, this voting function. So feedback that we got from the acquisition community through our usability testing sessions, where we go through current as well as upcoming functionality on the gateway, was that's great that GSA or NASA or whatever agency provided this information thought it was useful, but how does another CEO or project manager out there in the universe also think this information is useful? How do I know that's been vetted by somebody some similar to my role? So we've added this voting functionality throughout some digital services in the gateway to address that concern that was voiced by the acquisition community in those sessions. So let's say Laura wants to follow a group. So I'm going to click on Furniture. And so she's going to follow this group. And so I've gotten confirmation. And so if I scroll down here on the left, it'll show my groups and furniture. So that way, every time Laura comes into the gateway, she doesn't have to be like, oh, what was that thing I followed the other day? What group was that? Was it software? Was it motor vehicles? She can just go straight to the My section and see what's important to her. So next we're going to go into one of the hallways so you can see what a typical layout is like. And so I'm going to click on IT. And so you'll see here on the right the community feed, particularly for the IT area, any new information and training and events. Uh, and while this loads, you'll see sub hallways, so any 
uh, subcategories related to IT. So if I click on IT consulting, all the information will filter for IT consulting or IT security, for example. Here's an article index. If I click buy online, it'll take you to links to transactional platforms where you can do procurements outside of the gateway. As well as if I click on the view prices paid but button, so I shared the prices paid portal earlier. In addition, hallways oftentimes have other information that we want, they want to share for prices paid, and so that's where this information would be. So you'll see some of these data sources here in relation to IT. So you'll see some features articles, the solutions finder that is not only pre-filtered for the agency, but the actual category as well. So as a GSA employee that wants to buy IT, for example, there's 55 solutions available. And then some various articles, templates, resources that can be accessed. So I'm actually going to go into another hallway really quick. So we're going to go into professional services. And so you'll see similar layout here, but tailored for professional services. I do want to note that you see in this new info uh, feed that this is general, not necessarily hallway specific. Uh, so here we go, similar setup as what you saw in the IT hallway. There is an extra button here, statement of work library, which I'll take you to in a minute. But I do want to show you some snazzy tools and templates here. And you'll actually see in the different, if I hover over one of these articles, it'll show you a preview of what information is in that article uh, so that you can decide whether it's important to you before you want to click on it. So here's information on the Smart Pay Training Forum, for example. So we're going to go here into the tools and templates for professional services. And I am going to actually go into Calc. And so as it comes up, what this particular tool does is it shows awarded labor rates uh, on the professional services schedule and to a certain extent some IT services as well. And so one thing I do want to mention is awarded hourly labor rates from those schedules. So as a CO or CS, you always want to get you know, the best price and the best value for your procurement. So we strongly encourage folks to use this information um, as part of their IGCE building, Independent Government Cost Estimate, or their market research, so that they can negotiate down from the awarded hourly labor rates. So let's say, you know, if we're going through this through the eyes of Janet C. Officer, she's buying cloud services, but she was looking for a project manager in the prices paid portal. Let's say she also wants to find one here. So I'm going to do a search on that. And you'll see that a project manager costs $130 an hour. Well, that could be a project manager with varying levels of experience. They may or may not be with me on site. So let's actually use these optional filters here on the right. Let's say we want this person to have a bachelor's degree with five to say mm, 10 years of experience. And we want them to be on site. And because we are supporting our agency's socioeconomic goals, we want this person to be from a small business. And so as I build these different optional filters, this data changes in real time. And so if I go down, you can actually see some of that criteria that I built in, the awarded labor hour price on that particular schedule or contract. You can actually see the contract number here uh, and the vendor that can do the work. And you can either download this graph or also export it, you know, in Excel, do some filtering with it. Uh, but it's, you know, a great resource for building an IGCE. You can build these filters, print it out, stick it in your contract file. So the last thing we're going to go to in the gateway is the statement of work library. And so this contains statements of work, statements of objectives, performance work statements from across the federal government that uh, we've collected and put into the library. And so the amount of information that's in here grows every day as we get more information from agencies that are wanting to share stuff, as well as just from folks out there in the acquisition community. So you see I'm scrolling down. I scroll all the way down to the bottom on the left. You can actually submit one of those documents 
um, upload it, hit save. And so this will go to the appropriate content manager who will work with you to vet and redact the information before it goes on the Statement of Work Library. So we're going to go back up. And so you'll see the search and filter functionality not only here in the Statement of Work Library, but a few of the digital services on the gateway as well. So you know, if we're thinking about this from Janet's perspective, she's buying cloud services, she's buying infrastructure as a service. Let's actually see what happens when we type in cloud. Without the E. And so there's 12 results related. 12 results related to cloud services. That's what happens when you think of results and desserts at the same time. <laughs> so let's see if there's anything related to Janet. Enterprise cloud computing, email, email, email. She was looking for infrastructure as a service. So here we go. She can either download this PDF if she just wants to check it out, or she can actually download this in Microsoft Word format and reformat it to her own needs for her own procurement. And you can actually see how many times it's been viewed and downloaded as well, and also the voting functionality. So that's a tour of the gateway. We encourage you to log in, check it out. We develop new functionality in the gateway every couple weeks. So what you see today may not necessarily but be what you see two months from now a year from now, and that's a good thing because we're developing the gateway with user feedback and making sure that we have a tool that folks want to use and can use on their in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, so that's the demo. So I want to close with a couple of reminders. So we're going to go back into the slide deck. So logging in and exploring the gateway, hallways.cap.gsa.gov. Don't forget to link your OMB Max ID to your PIV card or your CAC card. Also, joining the community on the gateway, so connecting, contributing ideas, joining in on conversations on what people are talking about, and then sharing those best practices, lessons learned, whether it's through nuggets of information on the community or information on the Statement of Work Library. Also, helping us build through usability testing. I had mentioned this is how we build the enhancements on the gateway. Once or twice a week, we have these sessions with folks. They last about 60 minutes. And Kelly Robinson, you can see her email on the screen, kelly.robinson at gsa.gov, is in charge of those sessions. And we take feedback from those sessions. We go through current as well as upcoming functionality on the gateway and get that feedback to really make sure we're building a tool that folks can use throughout the acquisition life cycle. Outstanding, Andrea. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to you, our viewers, make Andrea happy and get signed up in the Acquisition Gateway to become an active part of the community now. We hope you've learned a lot by seeing how category management will help better meet the evolving needs of the acquisition community. But the learning isn't done. Now our team will present the question and answer session from our live seminar. Thank you for returning to the Category Management and Acquisition Gateway Acquisition Seminar Question and Answer Session. Joining us is Andrea Azarkin-Heller from the U.S. General Services Administration. Andrea, thanks for sticking around with us. Thanks, John. So let's jump into these questions we, were, we have received from our audience members. First one, what does category management look like? What are some tangible examples? That's a good question, and that's a question that we get a lot because category management Laura went into it. it. It's a lot of concepts, and so what does that look like in real practice? And uh, a couple of examples, one that we talk about quite a bit um, internally within GSA is fleet vehicles. So motor vehicles, they've been doing category management really before it was even a thing, one, in GSA, and two, being implemented across the government through folks like OFPP. So uh, mandatory use of GSA for the purpose of non-tactical fleet vehicles. Um, what this looks like in terms of category management is it reduces contract duplication and price variation. I believe um, they get savings of 19% off of MSRP. Um, and there's a lot of data that our motor vehicles program collects. So um, we're able to share this with uh, other people that are buying motor vehicles in the federal government. We're able to really manage the demand, manage that supplier 
relationship. Um, and since there's all this data available and uh, the purchase of non-tactical vehicles goes through uh, this particular contract, we're able to get more spend under management. And this is important because uh, it improves customer satisfaction and engagement. We're constantly working with folks that buy motor vehicles to improve what's offered on the contracts and also frees up agency resources. So uh, they can really concentrate on the mission as opposed to, okay, what is my fleet gonna look like? Excellent. Well, then let's jump uh, to the next question. And that is, how is the acquisition gateway being built? I'm assuming that's more from a content perspective as opposed to platform, but how would you tackle that one? So the gateway is being built using agile software development. For folks that aren't necessarily familiar with agile, it's an iterative process. And so uh, when you see things on the gateway, uh, we have enhancements that are deployed every couple of weeks. We also uh, plan what we uh, what you guys see on the gateway around three or four month, uh, what we call release cycles. And so um, you're always seeing something new on the gateway. What you see, what you might have seen yesterday might be different, you know, a couple of weeks from now or even a couple of months from now or even potentially a couple of years from now. And that's a good thing. We're building the gateway with user feedback to make sure that the functionality is what people are wanting, but also making sure that it fits the acquisition lifecycle and helps folks do their jobs. Good. Well, then along with that, if since things are changing, you mentioned the functionality, the content going to be constantly changing with the Agile framework. How would one find, under question number three, how would I find the information I need on the acquisition gateway? So we have various digital services and hallways on the gateway that you saw during the demo. So the digital services are, th are things that the gateway team builds like eBuy Open to see past RFQs, RFPs in the eBuy Open system or the statement of work library that, where they can see past documentation on that. In addition, we categorize things around the government wide categories. So like a professional services or a travel and lodging so that things are easy to find uh, based on how people think and how they buy. Nice. Well, from a more, I guess, conceptual standpoint, maybe even more policy, under question number four, where do you see category management five years from now? So there's a couple of ways of answering that question. I believe Laura had alluded to what is the, the operating model for category management. It's three stages, the, the, plan the, the planning, the execution, and the performance management. And since it's a cycle, we're always gonna be somewhere in that particular model. I think within, in five years, we'll definitely be more in the you know, execution performance management because we've gotten more things off the ground. So that's one way of looking at it. In addition, from a more general standpoint, is that category management will give, it's an approach that'll give us more visibility into overall costs and a holistic approach in developing solutions. So like Laura mentioned earlier, minimizing redundancies, reducing total costs of ownership for government and the taxpayers. We're also seeking to increase partnership with and participation by small businesses to continue to meet or exceed folks' socioeconomic goals. And then also the success of category management in general. In addition, federal procurements will see a boost in innovation with tools like the acquisition gateway because it'll provide access to all, you know, all this data, all these communities of practice, uh, helping us be more transparent, reduce price variances for the things that we buy. Sounds good. And I'm sure by then, you'll have even better projections or at least better evidence of how much you've saved mm -hmm. or you know the cost avoidance yep. that you've got going on as well. Fantastic. Well, let's then jump to question number five, a little more practical here. How can this initiative be applied to specialized services such as hiring research contractors and or conducting survey research or field data collections? So to me, this sounds like a professional services type question. And if I'm completely off base, whoever answered this question, is more than happy to email gateway underscore communications at gsa.gov so we can get some clarity around this. But the way that I'm interpreting is, is how can you use the gateway to help you figure out how to buy things such, you know, these specialized services, 
getting contractors, survey research, field data collections. There's a few different things that you can do, and I think I outlined some of this in the demo. So eBuy Open is a really great resource for this because you can see what people have done in the past in terms of their RFQs and RFPs, but also uh, the ability to download any attachments with those procurements, so like statements of work, performance work statements, statements of objectives. That's one way to uh, apply that to specialized services. Another is to go into the professional services hallway and see what content uh, is there in relation to the particular type of service you're buying. Also, Statement of Work Library has some information on um, how to buy some of these things as well. So really good question. A few different things that you can do. And it sounds like, too, it's dependent upon the community. The mm -hmm. extent to which we all share what we have done in the past or what we're doing right now, that's going to drive some of these innovations in the future. Right, and it's great that you bring up the community. Another thing that I forgot to add is uh, going into the community on the gateway and posting questions such as this. Fantastic. Let's go to question number six then. Will GSA expand category management to laboratory or medical equipment? So we are in the process of doing that right now. So medical, uh, which is from a government-wide standpoint, co- um, for lack of a better word, owned or managed by the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, and I believe DOD, specifically Defense Health Agency, with also HHS, you know, providing some play into that, but not necessarily ownership of the category. Um, we are trying to work with the agencies that buy this stuff to get content related to the medical category on the hallway. So yes, we're working on it. It's coming, yes. it's ever expanding, <laughs> very good. So the next question. All contracts have ceilings. Contracts are currently made for specific purposes and organizations. How can someone use some other agency contract and not bust their ceiling? So when I see this question, there's a couple different flavors of this. One, this, this is a very nuanced contracting question. I used to be a CEO myself. And two, this also triggers from the gateway standpoint, me going into Solutions Finder. So if you go into Solutions Finder, you can see the different types of contracts that are listed in the system. Um, in its entirety, as of today, we have 217 listed in the system, and that number grows every day. What's available to you and your agency will vary based on uh, where you work. That being said, in relation to the question, so when you go into the Solutions Finder, It'll show different information on the particular contracts. You can go to the solution website, uh, view either the master contract file or the terms and conditions, depending on what um, that particular program office has provided us. And ceiling price information should be included in there. That being said, um, you, there's, points, there's a point of contact listed in the solutions finder if you have a question on um, that particular contract. So if you're wondering how close they are to reaching you know, the ceiling that was initially awarded, feel free to contact that person. In addition, what the ceiling actually is, is most likely listed either in that master contract file or in the terms and conditions that are linked there. Great, okay. Now, the next question. Oh, the sneaky devils. It's more like two questions packed into one. Uh, let me see if I can get this all out. Is the acquisition gateway intended for contracting officers, representatives, or cores that are in program offices in addition to contracting officers or contracting specialists and within a specific agency, who should be responsible for conducting the market research to support a specific procurement, the contracting officers, contracting specialists, or the cores? So is the gateway intended for cores in addition to what I think a lot of people consider the traditional uh, acquisition community? And you can't see me right now, but I'm doing air quotes. Um, yes, it absolutely is. Uh, I don't know if we're, for, uh, quite a few you are joining us as a result of our Summer Gateway Games campaign. And if you're not familiar with that, we will get into that a little bit. Um, but for those that are, you might have joined us last week in Stacy Swan's pentathlon session with the scavenger hunt. Um, and one of the things that she discussed is this is actually a great, a really great tool for folks uh, that are not necessarily actually doing acquisition. So cores and folks in the program or, or project um, management offices, uh, because it gives them not only, you know, a place to find out what is going on in a particular product or service category, but also the ability to learn about acquisition enough where they can have an educated conversation with the CO or the CS assigned to them. 
in a, regards to the second part of the question, who should be responsible for market research? Um, this is purely, you know, Andrea opinion. Uh, I'm sure some people will have differing opinions. Uh, when doing a procurement, I believe it's all hands on deck and market research, because it's so important to understand what is out there, um, the acquisition folks and the program folks, um, really should be both doing the market research. Um, they could potentially do it, you know, um, in parallel, but come together to be like, this is what I found and how can we use that information to go forward to uh, get the best value and really get um, what they're needing and wanting to support the mission of their agency. So getting back to, you've got to work as a team. Yes, you really do. Out. Yeah, and that's, that's really what the gateway is about. We did some, um, we did a study with a contractor uh, as we were building the gateway in terms of what are the pain points of the acquisition community. And really the biggest one that we discovered was, um, and what the need was, was a way to facilitate collaboration between COs and CSs of the world and the program folks. And the gateway has quite a bit of, few, quite a bit of tools in there that do that right now. Um, and we're really looking to expand um, in the coming year on, on our capability to do that. That sounds good. We'll just have to stay on top of that. Well, folks, unfortunately, we need to stop there because that's all the time we have. But before we go, Andrea, we have a few shameless plugs, I think, to highlight. Why don't we get to those? Yes, thank you. So I've been looking forward to this. So the first one, IT security hallway. So we are calling all cybersecurity experts. Stay current. Help your fears. The your peers, I'm sorry. The IT security category manager is looking for cybersecurity acquisitions and program experts willing to share their experience as regular contributors to the IT security hallway on the acquisition gateway. So selected individuals will participate in their choice of social media and or articles of interest to the cybersecurity community. If you're interested, please contact Hilken Falcon uh, on the email address on the screen, hiltonfalcon at gsa.gov. So the next one, uh, yesterday, no, today's Wednesday. So Monday, <laughs> uh, we premiered on the GSA, GSA YouTube channel a introductory video on the acquisition gateway, and that will be a, the first in a series of videos talking about what the gateway is, who it's for, and what it does. So please visit our channel, scroll down to the upload section, um, and please check out our video on what is the acquisition gateway. And also, don't forget, we've been, you know, we did a gateway demo. Please visit us, hallways.caf.gsa.gov. Uh, and we'll go to the next slide. And then finally, gateway ambassadors. We're looking for folks like you to get your input and also uh, grow the gateway, grow its community, and um, share the gateway and its benefits uh, with your colleagues. So if you're interested in joining the gateway ambassadors program, please contact Craig Chavez or Tanika Jenkins. You can see their email addresses on the screen. We meet about once a month um, and we can get you some information on exactly what that entails, have a conversation with you um, about the level of effort. But we meet once a month. It takes maybe about a couple of hours of your time uh, outside of that to, to get your feedback um, and also see what's going on in your agency. So we have uh, ambassadors from across the federal government from a bunch of different agencies, and we're looking to grow that group. So if you're interested, please contact Craig or Tanika. That's great. Thank you again, Andrea. Really do appreciate you taking care of our questions, our answers, and our shameless plugs. Thank you. We hope you found today's seminar very educational and useful in demystifying category management and the acquisition gateway. Our thanks to Laura Stanton, Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Strategy Management, Federal Acquisition Service, General Services Administration, and to Andrea Azarkan Heller, Acting Director of the Stakeholder Management Division, Office of Strategy Management, Federal Acquisition Service, General Services Administration, for her demonstration of the Acquisition Gateway. And last but not least, the Federal Acquisition Institute thanks you, our dedicated viewers, without whom doing all this would have no meaning. Thanks again. <laughs>